We are in the midst of celebrating hip hop's 40th anniversary, and it is important to acknowledge and reaffirm that Latinos have played a vital role in the history of hip hop, and tonight's panelists will share their experiences in the hip hop movement and their insight into the topic. I'll start off with Frankie Cutlass, producer, DJ, and artist. By age 15, Frankie Cutlass had already done production for 1980s freestyle artists TKA, K7, Sapphire, The Cover Girls, George Lamont, Cynthia, Judy Torres, Lizette Melendez, Karina, and I can go on and on and on. Break it down. <laughs> <laughs> By the early 1990s, Cutlass joined superstar DJ Funkmaster Flex's The Flip Squad and often spun at special events and in the airwaves of New York City's Hot 97. To his left, hip-hop scholar extraordinaire, we have Miss Martha Diaz. She is the hip-hop scholar in residence at the Schomburg Center for Black Research and Culture and the director of the Hip-Hop Education Center. Martha Diaz is an award-winning community organizer, media producer, archivist, curator, social entrepreneur, and adjunct professor at New York University's Gallatin School. To her left, the one and only, Charlie Chase, pioneering DJ of the Cold Press Brothers. Charlie Chase is the first Latino DJ in hip hop to officially emerge and establish Latinos as a force to the masses in hip hop. As a Puerto Rican DJ, Chase played in the streets, parks, clubs, schools of New York City and others in other areas. Alongside pioneers such as Cool Herc, Africa Bambada, Grand Wizard Theodore, Grandmaster Flash, and so many others, becoming a force to be reckoned with. Playing everything from hip hop, salsa, R&B house, disco, and rock was how Chase gained respect as a DJ. He co-founded the world famous Cold Crush Brothers with his partner Tony Tone. Together they, re they recruited Grandmaster Kaz, uh, Hutmaker JDL, Almighty KG, and Easy AD thus becoming one of the primary influences imitated by many DJs, MCs, and rappers to this day. In 2003, Chase was inducted into the Technics DMC DJ Hall of Fame, and he currently spins at WMNF in Tampa and continues to play for his fans all over the world. And lastly, but certainly not least, Jorge pop master Fable Pavón, has many titles, I'll keep it to just historian and vice president of the Rocksteady crew. Uh, Fable is a legend, a pioneer, a historian, an activist within hip hop culture who has also expressed himself as a digital artist, videographer, editor, and DJ. As vice president of the Rocksteady crew and an honorary member of the Electric Boogaloos, Fable is also the co-founder of the Ghetto Original Productions, Inc with Ghetto Original Pabon, co-authored, co-directed, co-choreographed the first two hip-hop musicals ever. Um, when I first started as a DJ, um, in 75, when, when I was just like, just getting into it, and, and I was watching like one of my, my, my heroes, who is Grandmaster Flash, who also became like a nemesis, but you know, we're really good friends, you know. But anyway, um, as I was getting into, but I wanted to battle him, yeah. But anyway, um, as I was getting into the music and I remember uh, uh, playing beats, I was playing break beats in my house and I'm making all kinds of noise and I'm driving my mother crazy and um, people that would come to my house or sometimes I, I, I put, bring my set out into, into the park, people would, would, they would criticize me, Latinos especially, like I, they would tell me, what are you doing playing that Jungle Bunny music? You know, like they were really opposed to me doing this. You know, because they said, you're Latino, you know, do what you're supposed to do. And it's like, supposed to do, you know what I mean? I didn't know I was supposed to do anything. But there was, I was getting a lot of, of flack from, from Latinos for doing what I was doing. But I, I ignored it, you know. Um, I basically didn't listen to them. I just put my blinders on and just kept, kept on my path. You know, I just, you know, I, I, I don't know. They were, they were close, but you have to understand, in 75, there was a completely different frame of mind when it came to things. Everybody was into Hector Labo. We have a wide you know? age demographic here. Why don't you kind of give us a little background and fill us in on what that time was like? Well, at that time, man, I mean, I, I, I mean, I grew up listening to salsa music, you know, Hector Labo, La Fania, uh, you know, it was predominantly uh, salsa music and then uh, 
um, disco wasn't even the, well. Disco was around, but I mean, it was like you know, it, just, it, was, it was weird because it was like real. It was too. I don't know. It was just too, too, too. How do you want to say? Too glittery for me, man. You know what I'm saying? I, I wasn't into that. But um, at that time, you know, it was all about cars. It was about uh, salsa music. Uh, basically, I got into it just because I, 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 I wanted to speak to girls. You know what I'm saying? I just wanted to get some attention from girls, you know, and, and at that time it was it was a free time. It wasn't so commercialized. It wasn't so, uh, uh, how do you say, peer pressured at the time. Like, you know, nowadays everybody wants to, wants to, wants to live up to a certain expectation. You know, everybody's got to have fresh clothes. Everybody's got to be a certain way. You know, everything is... And in genres and in and, 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 and compartments, you could say, you know, back then it wasn't like that. It was like, I mean, there were stations that were still playing a mixture of music. They weren't like today, like you have one station playing hip hop, one station playing rock, one station playing salsa. Back then, it wasn't like that. We had stations that were playing multicultural music. You know? WABC. Yeah, you could, that's the station I grew up in, that station. Now, that station was basically, even before FM stations came into play, that station was playing literally everything. That's, that's how I became, that's how I, I came to, to love everything. I mean, sometimes in my house, I'll, I'll, I'm playing some, some rock music, and sometimes I'll play some Pavarotti, and the kids walking by my room looking at, you know, like, what's Dad doing now, you know? And it's like, but it became the norm in my house. It's just that they didn't understand that I really do appreciate all kinds of music because I was brought up that way. Okay, uh, I just asked that no one records this. You know, if you don't mind, bro. Thank you. Um, before I get started, I want to acknowledge two people in this room. First one is my partner for my new record company called Cutler's Music Group, which lounged last year. Uh, she's been a special woman in my life. She's been a good friend overseeing the label. Um, she's a, a special mother to two kids. And um, growing up in Pats in New Jersey, it really, you know, is a rough neighborhood. And, you know, I take my hat off to her because raising her, her kids as a single parent, one of them happened to be a very successful NFL player for the New York Giants. Um, he's the guy that when he goes to the sideline, he dances salsa. And she's my partner, and she's here right now, Victor Cruz's mother, Blanca Cruz. <laughs> talking, about, talking about lifting up Boricuas. <laughs> so, the second person, I want to acknowledge Ralph McDaniels. I'm going to tell you why. Blacks never gave me a hard time when it came to hip-hop, when it came to hip-hop. Actually, the Latinos gave me a hard time. I know when I leave this room today, a lot of you Latinos are not going to like me. <laughs> but I'm going to speak the truth. Because there's still a problem to this day. Ralph, you were the first African brother who played the video Puerto Rico on Music Video Box. Funk Master Flex was the first DJ to play Puerto Rico. When I have given copies to a lot of Latino DJs, they looked at me, they said, you crazy, I ain't playing this. Funk Master Flex and that bum named DJ Red Alert, <laughs> they were the first DJ to play Puerto Rico. They dare to play it. Ralph dared to play it. He said, nah, we're going to pump this. We got the Latinos back. So, it's kind of a little, you know, sensitive to me when it comes to this whole Latino thing because I went through a lot with the whole Latino thing. 1997, there's a, there's a two-page article in Source magazine and we talked about, you know, Latinos. And back then I was very bitter when it came to Latinos because I seen a lot of the doors, I seen the envy and the jealousy when it came amongst the Latinos. I was getting a lot of love from the blacks. 
believe it or not. And I have to really say the reason why I'm probably successful today was because of the African American brothers in the industry who believed in me, who said, you, you know, Latino, come on, you're going to fuck Master Flex is one of them. He approached me, Frank, you want, you know, who's managing you? I need this Puerto Rican, you know, DJ slash producer, rapper, whatever, you know, by my side. And Flex there, and he said, let's go, let's do it. So, really to start this whole panel off is, you know, we still have a problem to this day. I mean, you know, and we're going to get into it, you know, more later on. Really quick, I had an incident where, um, not an incident, but it was just, it was just kind of funny. How many of you guys heard that new Joel O.T. song called um, Road Deep, something like that? It's a new joint, it came out. He's got my song on in Puerto Rico. And, you know, I kind of like sat back. He got Victor Cruz in the video. He's got a lot of cameo. Diego got lit on. He's got a lot of, you know, cameo in the video, whatever. And then when, you know, Puerto Rico's playing in the hook, you know, I'm kind of like, I, in the back of my head, I'm going, man, it only would have been right if he would have just called me and said, Frank, we need you to appear in this video. You know what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm, I'm being biased by it. Like, nah, I ain't going to, you know, that's that whole, you know, I don't want to be, you know, that dude to be, you know, always complaining, you know? But what was funny was, I came across this, this, this article. Just at, somebody sent me an article yesterday, and it talked about Joel O.T.'s new single, the video, and the, and the, and the, and the uh, people he had in the video. He's, and at the end of that article, he says, but the only one missing was Frankie Cutlass. <laughs> See the problem? There's a problem there, right? Yep. Why we ain't called Charlie Chase? Why we ain't called the rock study crew to do some little break dancing? So I'm gonna leave it there because it's you know just getting warmed up right now, you know. <laughs> no, there's definitely problems with gatekeepers in, in hip hop. Um, but being a person from Patterson, New Jersey, myself, I have to give it up to the mama. Um, I grew up, I'm, I'm from the second generation of, of hip-hop, and I grew up at a time where I was listening to Shannon and Africa Bambada, Soul Sonic Force, and, you know, Run DMC in my teenage years, and, um, you know, I never thought I wasn't black. I didn't know what black and white, the difference yet, because I was in the Patterson, where we had a melting pot of immigrants and African Americans were with us and we were just all one. So I didn't know there was a, a black hip hop, white hip hop, Latino hip hop, and I, I didn't know that until I got into the industry mm -hmm. and um, I realized, oh, there's some ownership here. And the thing is for me, hip hop is a consciousness. It woke me up, it inspired me, it ignited my soul, and it made me realize that I exist with everybody and we're all one. And this is a black consciousness, right, because there is scientific proof, archaeological proof, anthropological proof that we all come from the motherland, right, and that we're just evolved into different shades, but we're all one. And so it makes total sense to me that anyone can get infected and, you know, ignited by hip-hop's consciousness once you come, you know, in contact with it. So I, I didn't know. My mother, though, thought for sure, ¿Por qué está con esos cocolos? ¿Cómo es negro? ¿Por qué, why you want to be black? And it's like, oh, God. And to this day, my daughter's there, Anna, and she'll tell you, yeah, my grandma's racist. <laughs> and we're Colombian, we're Afro-Colombians. Colombia. And so so it was really, you know, difficult for me to deal with that because I, I'm not racist. And even my white brothers and sisters, um, you know, to me, I mean they are they can be devilish, but not everyone is. I mean we have black devilish people and Latino devilish people, right? We have them all, right? And so it's a matter of, you know, our actions. And so 
when I think about my contributions, I don't, I'm not an artist, I'm not a DJ, girl, MC, graffiti artist, unfortunately. I tried, couldn't, I didn't, no, I'm like Don, pennies, <laughs> nobody was, no. But I found my role in supporting the artist. I found my role in and seeing how it could connect to education. I, I saw how media was manipulating hip hop and I wanted to interfere, intersect, and I wanted to provide people with a real story. I wanted to push to the forefront the pioneers and the, and the artists to, to inspire people like me, like I was inspired. And so my role has been of a filmmaker, a documentarian, an archivist, a historian, and so, I have gotten resistance from my own community, my Latino community, but some of the Latinos in hip hop also. I'm not gonna mention that time table, but they, you know, everyone has to pay their dues because hip hop is like that too, right? You got, you gotta, you just can't walk into hip hop the cipher. Uh uh, you gotta prove yourself, and I had to prove myself. You know, because not everyone who get you know gets in has the same intentions, and so for me, I found that 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 was that there was resistance in the industry. Unless I wanted to be you know all up in my booty shorts or you know sleeping with people, they, people didn't want to hear me. I, I'm definitely not in any publications. <laughs> you, you don't. I'm not there. You won't. You look me up in the source. Actually. Twice I was um, in the stores for selling these Latino t-shirts, um, <laughs> Costa Borwear, uh, because Spike Lee inspired me to do my own version of his 40 Acres, and I, I started this, don't panic, we're only Hispanic t-shirt. <laughs> so the stores covered that. <laughs> but other than that, I'm, I'm rambling now, but, um, you know, I'm definitely not covered, but Latinos have contributed to the um, archiving, because Joe Conzo has been pho photographing hip hop from day one. You know, we've been writing about hip hop. You know, whether it's Elena, Raquel Cepeda, um, we've been um, scholars from day one. Raquel Sanchez, I mean not Sanchez, Raquel Rivera, um, and um, Jeff Andrade is dunking on the West Coast. Um, Lisa Cortez has been a filmmaker producer. I mean, we've been part of it from day one on all capacities, you know, from the artist to the producers. Kind of to piggyback. Glad that you got the mic, Frank. I'm going to kind of throw this to you to start it off. Um, how have Latino hip-hop artists been traditionally marketed by radio stations, and did this play a role in marketing hip-hop as a black thing? Um, I think it's about quality, you know, as a Latino, like, for example, me, you know, I didn't, I didn't get that break with Notorious B.I.G. when I produced that song, um, that he did with Luke, because I was a whack producer. He's, he heard the quality, he heard, you know, the production. So, we, we got, you know, all my stuff got played on the radio. You know what I'm saying? But, of course, like DJs that want to break records, they're going to listen to the music, and if the music is good, they're going to play it. I never had a problem. Personally, I never had a problem getting my, my music played on the radio. So, um, to answer your question, uh, I can't really answer because I never, I, I, I think we got a fair share. I just, you know, just like right now with Joel Ortiz, and I keep saying Joel because, you know, Joel to me is like, he's, he's respected as a, as a you know, MC. You know, to me, he's like, you know, the next big pun. You know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, he, he, he goes up, you know, they play his stuff on hot, they play his stuff in, all over the world, they play his stuff because it's quality, you know, good, you know, hip hop. So I, I you know, to me, I can't really answer that question, so, you know. And, and, and I gotta respectfully disagree. I think, you know, there's a serious problem in the radio station and media, I mean, you know about the payola. I mean, that's a big problem. You can pay to get on the radio. Okay. I never, I never paid Flex and he played my stuff. Right, right. But, you know, 
but but there is a problem, and so we have a whole bunch of conscious artists that cannot get on the radio that are quality artists, right? You can have quality beats, but your message could be whack, and you there's a problem. There's a problem, good friend. You know there's a problem, and so. Uh, <laughs> Well, you know, when you talk about that, I can speak about one experience that, 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 that I, I ran into with a group that I was producing, which was a Latin hip-hop group back in, in the early 80s, uh, uh, mid-80s, called Latin Empire. They were signed to, uh, yeah, they were signed to Atlantic Records. And they were having such a hard time getting their records played, but not because the radio stations were refusing it. It wasn't that. It was... The promotion department in Atlanta and Atlantic Records that was causing the interference because they were going to the company to meet with the promotion department to see what they could do about you know getting their records played. What can they do to, to advance their music to do what it is that it was two Puerto Rican guys trying doing Spanish English hip hop. You know they were doing break beats with Latin beats and I did some of their music for them, but. The thing was that the, the head of promotions in Atlantic was saying, you need to stick to your, to your kind of music. This is not going to work. You know, so uh, it, it, sometimes you can't blame the radio stations, you know. Sometimes it goes a little bit deeper than that. Sometimes it goes from, from the source. You have to look at the source, how they're pushing it, how, how they're trying to make the people view it, how they're advertising it. I mean, that's the way it starts. Uh, from my, that's the one experience that I can speak about, which, which I thought was critical if Atlantic Records would have handled it differently back then in the, in the mid-80s. Who knows where Latin hip-hop would be today? You know, it would have been way further advanced. You know, so I, that's, that's what I... Um, rock Hem, as you can tell, we've got quite a number of Rock Hem fans here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, famously rhymes, it's not where you're from, it's what, where you're at. How significant is the Bronx and New York in general as to the birthplace of hip hop, and how do the other boroughs fit into this picture? This is what I have to say about that. <laughs> I mean, the Bronx is very significant in the birth of hip hop because you you, you got to give it to Cool Herc. Cool Herc was the first one to actually have the nuts to say, "Hey, you know what? I'm taking my sound system. I'm taking it out into the park." And I'm gonna play this kind of music. You know, it started from there. Then that, like Martha said earlier, infected that area where her where Herc lived. And then people heard about it, people gravitated to her. Then from there it gravitated. I'm I'm one of the results of that. You know, uh, I learned from watching Flash, I learned from watching Herc, you know. The groups that came out of there, Funky Four Plus One More, Furious Five, tell me they, they're not significant. They're pretty significant groups. Um, you had my group that came out of there, Fantastic Five. Uh, there were several other groups that came out there. Most of these groups that I just mentioned got record deals that were significant, that were became global. In the sense of the Bronx is very significant in the birth of hip hop. I mean, it was just, it started in a park, then it went to other parks, then it went to clubs, and then it went to records. Even the first record that was, the first so-called rock record, was influenced by an artist who was managed, who was managing an artist from the Bronx, Grandmaster Cass, Big Bang Hand. He was on the record, he was from the Bronx. So the Bronx is very significant when it comes to the beginning of hip-hop.